Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. Regenerative plasma exchange is showing some remarkable results. What can it offer for patients to prevent or treat Alzheimer's disease and even overall longevity? David Hase, MD, is a doctor, teacher, author, and innovator. In his practice, he strives to be a super generalist, looking at the human body as a whole and applying curiosity to identify and treat the root cause of a patient's disease. After receiving his medical degree from Vanderbilt University, he trained at the Mayo Clinic and is now double boarded in family and integrative holistic medicine. He serves as lead faculty for the Institute for Functional Medicine. As founder and medical director of the Maxwell Clinic, he works to help his patients uncover the root cause of their illness and achieve better health. And now, please enjoy this interview with Dr. David Hase, MD. Hey, David, welcome to the show. Hey, Dr. Lefkin, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Please, please call me Rob. And all right, and, Rob. Uh, yeah, it's we. I know we we share a passion for for looking at the human body as as a whole, in order to understand diseases. And we have so many things to talk about with Alzheimer's disease, other other health things, and even longevity. But be, before we do that, I I wondered. Uh, this is the first time you been on the program. wonder if you would mind just telling uh, our listeners uh, when you first became interested, how you got interested in, in this fascinating area. Well, yeah, it's, it's, you know, when, it's always hard to know those, those points in time, right? But I, I grew up as a farm boy in South Dakota. And so I have a very practical mindset about, you know, uh, results are the only thing that matter is something you'll hear us say at, at our clinic a lot. And, um, that, uh, and, and I, it, I think it really hit the bug really hit me when I was at uh, Mayo clinic, uh, during residency. And I, I realized in this kind of flash one day, that, wow, everything we're doing, which is really important is being trained to diagnose and treat disease, uh, to name it, to blame it, to tame it, uh, you know, to, to say, wow, this, some, something has kind of fallen out of the sky and hit you on the head. And now us in modern medicine need to find a small molecule that's a blockbuster that's going to take away your symptom, take away, change the number or do, you know, fix you from the outside in. And instead I went, wow, um, everything I knew from farming is that, you know, crops are grown from the inside out. They come up from the soil with the support of the sun and the, and the water. Um, and, and in human too, you know, just like plants grow, we grow health every day. We actually have to repair and regenerate. Uh, every day we have to create health from the inside. Uh, matter of fact, aging is really every period of time in which you degenerate more than you regenerate. And um, that's, so I think what hit me is like, wow, here's all this great basic science. I love PubMed. I love the, I love nerding out over molecules and metabolomics and all these other nerdy things. Um, but if you reorganize that information, instead of trying to just make classifications that sometimes devolve down just into billing codes, um, and instead really try to understand the complexity of this human that's in front of you, engage and say, huh, why are they not expressing the, the best version of their genetic potential? Um, and what are the multifactorial causes that are behind that? And, and then how can we start to engage that person? How can we start a relationship, you know, uh, journeying alongside of with that person so that they can both understand why they're maybe not enjoying the health status that they desire, uh, but also know what to do about it. And then, and then try some stuff. <laughs> and, and I think what it would really turn me on was the, the fact that people got better. And, and from things that I was just told that we just need to treat the symptoms for. And um, yeah, that's, that's what really, it was early patient successes that went, huh, I can't ignore this. Uh, I really have to continue to uh, ask better questions so that we can potentially get better answers. 
Yeah, I, I think you and I uh, both from the at least training in the you know the traditional MD sort of medical system. I, I mean, I got the feeling that I was I was on a fire department. In other words, we were we were called to put out fires different places, and we'd run around and you know, like you say, you know, tackle a certain disease and then go to the next fire, but not taking the time to tell the people in the house not to leave candles burning, not to play with matches and everything, and then just, you know, going around waiting for the next fire. But, uh, yeah. you know, you're, you're doing so many, so many amazing things in your program, and I can't wait to, to get into that. But before, before we do that, maybe just um, take, a, take a broad overview. I, lo I love your approach to disease, and, and maybe start with with Alzheimer's disease, because that's uh, that's an interest for a lot of our audience here. And it, it just struck me that unlike other chronic diseases, what is it about Alzheimer's disease that has um, failed despite arguably the, the greatest minds in science and medicine and almost unlimited financial resources in the last 20 years mm -hmm. being applied to this disease? And unlike any other chronic disease, there hasn't been a single, a single drug that has been discovered that will uh, have a significant effect on the symptoms, let's say. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. Oh, I would a great question. See, with better questions come better answers, right? So, you know, the, 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 why, why haven't we gotten results? And I love the statement, you know, the, the way we see the problem is the problem. And, and so we're, if we think of Alzheimer's as a disease, like, well, let's pick a, let's pick a disease like pneumococcal pneumonia. Okay, here we go. Somehow that individual develops one bacteria has a party in a lobe of your lung and, and we can do microbiology and say, oh, it's that one bacteria in this place. And if we give this antibiotic, you know, reliably in a couple of weeks, you're going to be really okay. And um, uh, we hope. Um, but, and so the, the wonder drugs of medicine, penicillin, uh, anti-inflammatories, they have lured us and kind of uh, called us what the sirens call to believe that the solution to our problems is, is, is a pill, is, is bringing uh, some molecule to uh, actually, it's a well, most of our pharmaceuticals are well-dosed poisons. Right. That's why we need licenses to prescribe them because there's a therapeutic window, you know, within a certain freight, within a certain domain that they have uh, some degree of safety. Uh, a lot of a lot of these pills, oftentimes there's negative consequences. Right. Uh, and our medications are actually named that they're named anti this blocker that inhibitor there stimulator, you know, stimulator of that. And um, <clears throat> as a result they're designed to actually thwart the system. They're actually there to say, whoa, you know, the car's sliding down the hill, let's slam on an emergency brake. And, and good, we're really thankful for every tool that we have, okay? I don't, I, don't, I don't have any prejudice against any tool that's out there. I want the biggest toolbox possible so that we have the right tool for the right job given the person in the place, right? But, Alzheimer's is not like that. Alzheimer's is not a simple disease. It's not a single um, insult or injury or causation. Alzheimer's is a multi-system end-stage failure. And, and it is where we have multiple intersecting problems cause, com combining to cause a degenerative process. I like to think that we should stop saying that person has Alzheimer's disease and instead say they are Alzheimering, right? They're, they, they, they don't have dementia. They're dementing. Dementing literally means unbraining. And so now you go like, wow, it's a verb. It's not a noun. Okay. It's a verb. How do we change the expression of that verb? You know, if we, and if we do that, we become really curious about systems. What are all the interlocking systems that are causing the production and accumulation of uh, phosphorylated tau and amyloid beta, which are, you know, markers of the disease and, and then can become mediators and perpetuators of the disease. But it's not, it's not the reason for it, right? And so what are the vascular, the metabolic, the mitochondrial, the toxic, the inflammatory, the structural 
uh, coexisting causes that are causing this Alzheimering to move forward. And, and I think if we step back and look at it from a personalized systems medicine viewpoint, we get the opportunity to ask better questions, say, huh, for this individual, what are the major factors that are causing them to Alzheimer more aggressively? And, um, and if we change that perspective, we have a huge number of opportunities that all of a sudden appear to us. And especially like with your work with metabolic disease and being such a great advocate for, you know, the most, how much we can do to change our trajectory of health and disease. Um, wow, there's so much opportunity to change the trajectory of a common systems failure. Oh, and the last thing I want to say there is that, wow, we wait to diagnose a problem until we have so much brain death that this individual is disabled. I mean, that is an absolute idiocy, okay? And de denial is our number one comorbidity when it comes to dementia. You know, denial that mm, you're slipping a little bit. If you think you're slipping a little bit, you are, okay? <laughs> I mean, because you know yourself, you know how your brain works. And if you're having a subjective awareness of a slippage going on, you have a slippage going on. And that means there has been neurodegeneration of some sort. And I can say that with confidence because basically all of us are on a pathway of neurodegeneration of about 30 on. It just depends on how fast that slippage is going and, and how what type of accelerators are going on. So uh, yeah, if we view Alzheimer's disease as a systems problem and really a system of systems problems, then we have a whole opportunity for changing the trajectory of that degeneration and slowing it, stopping it, and possibly even reversing uh, that degenerative process. If, if Alzheimer's, as you, as you say, uh, the, the cognitive impairment is, is, is relatively late sign and we, you know, we deny it as, as humans do, we tend to deny things, especially that affect our, our the real soul of our existence, which is our cognition. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we lie to ourselves about it. What can people do to to catch Alzheimer's disease at an earlier time? And I, I mean, people say that you know the disease exists ten even thirty years before cognitive impairment is diagnosed clinically. What can people do to 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 start thinking about it earlier or look at it earlier? Well, I think they just did. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, really uh, getting the message out that, yeah, guess what? We're Alzheimering. You're Alzheimering. I'm Alzheimering. Um, we live long enough. For either our body or brain are going to give out. So I think number one, awareness is the first thing. Second is bravery. Yeah. To say, hmm, you know, if I am having some symptom, I need to pay attention to it. But I think most important is to recognize that because dementia, frailty, um, and so many of the diseases, quote, of aging that exist are really not diseases of aging. They're, they're diseases of this dysfunctional systems as they have accumulated. And so if you have a medical problem. So if you're a little hypertension, oh, I just got a little hypertension. I'm going to take a pill for that. No, but just definitely take the pill to control the hypertension. However, why are you hypertensive? What systems dysfunction is going on at that point in time and address that aggressively, get back to a state of health that is as self-created as possible, optimal health. Okay. Don't, we're not, I'm not ever encouraging somebody not to have high standards for their numbers and their measurements. But, uh, uh, you know, if you have an elevated blood glucose, guess what? You're Alzheimer's in an accelerated fashion. Take care of it then and there. Not, don't wait until you start having symptoms. If you're having, if there's things that are worsening your vascular function, you know, impaired uh, glycocalyx activity, in, in increased inflammation, um, you know, uh, abnormal lipid panels, all these different things that have a, have a component, address them now. You're actually un alzheimering as you address those multiple factors that you can identify, uh, those early dysfunctions that you can identify. And, and you should make ideal your standard, 
not just not having a diagnosed disease, but really understand that ideal function is what we should be shooting for. And anything less than ideal is less than ideal. So, um, and then outside of that, doing neurocognitive testing uh, is, is something that can be done in the home. There's a great uh, platform uh, called CNS Vital Signs, and most doctors can order it for you. Um, we, we have um, cognitive screeners that we're going to be making available on our website just to help people to, uh, under, to have this question, how's my brain doing? And, and I think that we should be looking at doing your vital signs of your brain function yearly, just like we would, oh, maybe get a bone density score and scan done yearly or, or you know, check your lipids, see how is your brain doing. And if it's slipping in a way that you don't recognize it's slipping, dig in and dig in from every angle. I'm, I'm a big fan of comprehensive evaluation. We shouldn't just, so if we think about Here's a great example. I had a patient in my office the last week, and we did a quantitative EEG on her. That's where we do a put a shower cap looking on the device on somebody's head, and we measure all their brain waves, and we compare those brain waves I think, against FDA normalized, standardized databases. And, and we saw, wow, she has a lot of excess delta and theta waves activity in this brain. It was actually that abnormal finding that is indicative of an early progression in the uh, Alzheimer's dementia process that led me to ask, hey, are you having any mental challenge, any memory challenges? She said, well, yeah, I haven't told anybody about it yet, but I'm a little less sharp than I used to be. And here on her neurocognitive testing, she's still at the 77th percentile for her age. So here's a person who nobody would think there's any you know, she's at the early stages of the end stage, right? When you start yeah. having symptoms, that's the, the early stage of the end stage. And you have to address, address it with that kind of aggressiveness. But yeah, there's, there's a whole host of tools to start asking, yeah, how is this brain dysfunctional? Those are great points. I just want to underscore one thing you said that just, just, it still amazes me to this day that, that, that everything is, is interrelated for, for Alzheimer's disease, let's say that elevated glucose that means you're pre-diabetic also means you have an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, that those lipids that are abnormal, that the hypertension you have are driven by the same factors. And, and even the calcium score, the CT calcium score of my coronary arteries, the elevated calcium is also an independent risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, as is the bacteria yes. in my mouth, the P. gingivalis. And, you know, it, yes. all these inflammation, inflammation, metabolic factors, they, they, if you help one, you'll help the other. So it, it's kind of a common road to good, good health that, that hopefully we can, we can all pursue. What, what are you, what are you most excited about David with Alzheimer's disease? And as far as the, the treatments and possibilities now, what, uh, what, what gets what gets you excited about it these days? Yeah, well, there's a lot that actually gets me excited. Um, I mean, I, I've already talked about my love of systems because we always want to, you know, finding and addressing underlying causes of illness is amazing. But there's there's one particular therapy that has not gotten anywhere near the attention that it needs to get, uh, and that is actually um, a, a, something I've been trained in, which is called apheresis. Uh, apheresis or therapeutic plasma exchange um, is a standard medical treatment uh, used to treat severe autoimmune disease in all major medical centers. Um, and what's been noted is that this actually has real strong potential for the reversal of neurodegenerative disease. And um, this is called, you know, we have been tweaking the protocols and we're probably the most uh, uh, have the highest volume of this kind of neurodegenerative uh, treatment plan uh, of any clinic in the nation. And we've been uh, looking at this for several years. And what's been, yeah, so what's amazing uh, was we actually have a very large clinical trial to back up the work that we've been thinking of for several, many more years. And this large trial, it's called the AMBAR trial. What it showed is that by utilizing this therapy, this plasma exchange or a plasma dilution process, we were able to um, slow the progression of moderate Alzheimer's disease by over 60% uh, 
over 14 months, 60% over 14 months, right? The new drug that's been approved is at most 10% over those 14 months. And, and this has been done, um, and what's even more interesting in mild Alzheimer's disease, uh, which I hate even saying the word mild Alzheimer's, that means these people are already you know, uh, disabled. They're unable to care for themselves fully at that point in time. But in that stage of the disease, there is actually improvement over those 14 months with repeated regenerative plasma exchange. And that is astounding, okay? That's astounding in itself. But you'll appreciate, um, as a radiologist, that they actually did FDG PET scans on these people before and after this trial. And they saw that there were... Um, uh, there was less neuronal death in the individuals that got plasma exchange than in the placebo group. And then they looked, so not only were there cognitive improvements, uh, but there's also normalization of phosphorylated tau and amyloid beta in the CSF of these individuals uh, bef you know, before compared to placebo. So, and I, did, I don't think I mentioned, this is a multinational, multi-center, randomized uh, not just placebo controlled, but sham controlled trial, largest study of its kind of this particular field in apheresis. Um, so it's a very well done study. And it was amazing. The results were basically buried. Uh, nobody talked about it. You, almost nobody has heard of this study actually being published. And I think it's an atrocity. Uh, huh. So, um, you know, we're, we're really working hard to not just bring this forward, but help other doctors and other centers, you know, bring this type of therapy forward. Um, because I think it is the greatest hope that we've seen in the process of neuro in the, for the concern of neurodegeneration of any outside in intervention. Now, and, and every time I talk about this, I always want to say, man, this is incredibly hopeful, but it's a both. And from my, my standpoint of systems-based medicine, you absolutely have to exercise. You need to clean your diet up. You, you have to do all of the other things. Uh, Alzheimer's is a full court press condition. And, and to say, oh, this one therapy is going to fix me despite myself. Well, I'm going to tell you this one therapy. We, we've already believe we've observed that people who have the best lifestyle and the best overall care and then have this added on top are the ones who do the best as opposed to thinking that there's going to be some, that I can, I can continue living a crap life and, and, and have a great brain. So. Wow. That, that's, that's so exciting. So let me understand this. We take the, take the plasma from one healthy person, the, the blood plasma, and then uh, we uh, administer it to an Alzheimer's patient and not quite, not quite. Okay. So let, let me, let me go. And it's a kind okay. of a common misperception yeah. because uh, there, there are many different ways that plasma can be used as a medicine. And, and, and I think and we're actually involved in some really exciting research to understand many of these different variables. Uh, I'm so excited. I, I am just geeked out like I can't begin to tell you because we're going to get help to get some better answers on dosing and appropriateness. And uh, anyway, um, but the, so therapeutic plasma exchange is where an individual sitting, sits in a chair and there's two big two big IVs that are in that individual. And out that blood comes out one IV, it comes and it gets mixed with an anticoagulant. So the blood is really thin. And then it goes through a big centrifuge, continuous centrifuge. And the cells with the white cells, red cells and platelets all kind of go down one tube. And then the plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood that contains proteins and immunoglobulins, but also contains a whole bunch of toxins and cellular messengers, uh, that turn on the inflammatory response. All of that goes and gets discarded. Now that, that, plas that protein filled fluid needs to be replaced. So we actually use a uh, standard pharmaceutical albumin that then gets replaced and mixed with that blood. And then that gets returned to the patient. We've got several other pieces, several other pieces of the puzzle that we do to decrease side effects and improve outcomes. So there's more detail to it than that as we've, as we've been bringing this forward. But in simply, uh, we're removing the old plasma and putting in um, you know, the plasma that's been highly purified uh, or, or an albumin that's been highly purified, highly clean. It's not, it's not kind of coming from one person to the other. Now, there are some, uh, there are some early studies and some work being done with looking at 
could you actually have improvement by exchanging, making that exchange fluid, the plasma from young, healthy donors? Well, there may be some benefit to that, uh, but there's also a lot of known and unknown risks in that domain. And, and I'm very much of the belief and always have been that uh, my first job is to do least harm. I do least harm. So we focus very strongly on safety uh, and, um, and that, especially when we're in these areas that um, we, have to care, we have to care for people as we would want ourselves cared for, or our parents or our children cared for. And um, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so wow. it's, does that help so, explain it a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So what, what do you think is going on with that? What is it about the plasma? Have they filtered it? And is it the plasma or is it materials in the plasma? Or, or what do you, what, what's the mechanism do you think that's uh, what's helping these patients? Oh, it's a great question. I have, oh, how many hours do we have? <laughs> because, you, you know, uh, you know, in my practice, you know, with our, with, with some of our patients, we're diving into whole genome, whole metabolome, whole transcriptome, volumetric MRI, quantitative, we really love the data and to, to know, you know, why is it, what, and trying to figure out who's going to benefit most from these procedures and, and who should get treated sooner than waiting until they actually have memory loss. All of those are important questions. But, um, you know, when I think about how we approach the treatment of this disease, it, it is starting early. It is starting, um, uh, it is, is starting in a way that um, is safe. One of the miracle things about plasma, when we really recognize that this is working, we have to ask, well, why is it work? And it goes back to lifestyle medicine, because what is plasma? Plasma is the great interface. Plasma is the interface between what we eat and our blood, what we put on our skin and our blood, and what we breathe in and our blood. And, and that blood then goes to our innermost parts and tissue. So when we're removing the plasma, we're affirming that junk, you know, dirty plasma is there are things in there that are perpetuating illness. And, and those could come from the gut, from the air, from the, um, what we put on our skin or what's produced inside of us. So the whole, the whole, you know, so <laughs> there's so many things that are actually being removed. Let me ask you this. What is the number one antioxidant that is in your bloodstream? And I'm going to give you a little pimp question, just like we do with medical students. So For it's me? unfair. It's unfair of me, right? But what's the number one <laughs> antioxidant when I know I'm just telling the audience, this is unfair to do to somebody, but yeah, what's the number well, one antioxidant in your bloodstream. Well, I'm still learning this with people. I know glutathione is a great antitoxin, uh, but the antioxidant uh, would be uh, would be red blood cells, right? So, yeah, uh, glutathione is uh, about is a really important antioxidant, super important. Uh, about fifteen percent of it lives inside your mitochondria, but not a lot of it in your bloodstream. It's mm. actually albumin. Oh, okay. Albumin, the protein albumin that floats around your bloodstream. And then the second place is uric acid, which is amazing. You know, low uric wow. acid is actually a predisposing factor for Parkinson's disease, which is interesting. Um, wow. But uh, if your al albumin has a whole bunch of sites on it that soak up free radicals, that basically is a sponge and it's going through your body as a sponge and it's cleaning stuff up. So the more inflammation you have in your body, which is fire at the level of cells and tissue, the more oxidative stress you make, which is really fire at the level of molecules. And, and so albumin is kind of that wet blanket that you throw over the fire and it, and it gets damaged, it gets glycated. So sugars attached to albumin and um, yeah, so sugars attached to albumin, uh, oxidative molecules attached to albumin, there are a whole host of uh, toxins that go on there. And, and beta amyloid has a relationship with albumin as well. So the idea was, it's like, well, wait a second. Um, we know that the CSF of Alzheimer's patients, um, excuse me, let me back up. In the blood of Alzheimer's patients, their albumin is more oxidized than in the albumin of usual of healthy patients. 
But if you look at the CSF, at the, at the fluid surrounding the brain, the albumin in the CSF of Alzheimer's patients is amazingly more oxidized than the CSF of a healthy person. So the question was, it's like, wow, maybe the albumin itself is toxic. Let's remove the old albumin and decrease the injury pattern and maybe uh, basically put in this massive antioxidant sponge, you know, that can clean up the body and can help remove uh, toxins and such. Now that's one theory, um, but there's so many things in plasma. We have a huge cytokine reservoir. So we have observed some really interesting changes in body-wide cellular behavior when we do plasma exchange. Um, because the really interesting part about all this, the really interesting part is what is plasma exchange doing at the level of longevity? Because remember, Alzheimer's is an age-related disease and aging is more degeneration than regeneration. It turns out in the animal models that basically gave rise to this whole hypothesis that uh, if you put old stem cells into a younger environment, or even just a cleaner environment, those old stem cells start to act younger again. And they start to do more repairing, no matter where they are, if they're in the skin and the liver and the kidney, uh, in the olfactory bulb, in the hippocampus, uh, in the bone, in the immune system. In animal models, we've seen upregulation and an improvement of the stem cell function in all of these organ tissues with the equivalent of this plasma exchange process. And, and it's been fun to watch our patients actually start to like look younger. Uh, when, when it was very funny, uh, one of our early Alzheimer's patients that came in for plasma exchange, he uh, uh, was going through the process and after his uh, 12th exchange, because uh, we were going after it very aggressively, not only did he say, you know, I, my brain is functioning as good as I can remember it functioning. His wife said, you know, his, his memory is as good as it has been in the last 12 years I've known him. Uh, so, you know, had a huge improvement his mood improved, his energy improved. It was, it was a kind of a little bit of like, is this for real? Um, and we, we were laughing about it. And then, and then we, then his wife said, she says, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of this. I want to be the one doing this because look at his skin, look at his skin. And, and because his skin was just looking better. And I, I'm not really an aesthetics guy, you know, I, I'm really all, I love the brain and I love function. So I was like, yeah, he looks good, but no, he looks great. And, and I was like, no, I can't say that works for everybody. And he was doing everything else. Right. I mean, really eating, you know, how, when somebody changes from a junk diet to a clean diet and they start exercising and caring for themselves and drinking water, and all those other things, they look younger too, right? Decrease their stress load. That helps too. So I, I think it's all, it's a, I never want people to think that, wow, this is the one thing that's going to work. No, the question is, yes, it's very helpful. I think this is going to be a remarkable therapy and already is, um, but it, it's, it, it's remarkable because the body heals. If we go back to our, my, what I said at the beginning is that the body is what creates health and it's our job to remove the barriers that are impeding the body to create health or add in the resources that are necessary for the body to create health. And, and then guess what? It knows how to do this stuff. And, um, and we, can have, we can have more good days. And really at the end of the day, you know, when, when, I, when I, why do I do this work? Because A, oh my God, I value wisdom. I value wisdom. I think wisdom is our number one resource that we have in the world. It is our scarcest resource. It is our most precious resource. And wisdom is held in elders. And, and an elder is, is essentially an old person, somebody that had a lot of experience with a brain capable of communicating that experience and condensing it down for the next generation. So I, I deeply, deeply value wisdom as a reason why why we do this work. And, um, and that's, uh, that's where, where we got to where we are. That's, yeah, that's, a, that's a beautiful, beautiful thought. I, 
And as you were talking about the albumin and longevity, just occurred to me, we, we had on the program, we, we were interviewing a, a professor from the University of Zagreb named Gordon Lautz, and his specialty is glycans, and all he looks at is glycans. But I know you're interested in biological clocks and all that, and one of the things he's done is he's looked at glycation Yep. Uh, glycosylation, not gly uh, glycosylation of albumin um, as a marker for chronic disease and aging. And he's developed even a biological clock called glycan age, where yes. it looks at the albumin. So it, like you say, at some level, the albumin is fundamentally tied to these chronic diseases and, and even longevity itself uh, as well. And He's, he's showing that the glycan age uh, clock where, where you collect it with a blood sample is similar performance as a biological clock to uh, you know, Steve Horvath's epigenetic DNA methylation clocks and, and, and some of those as well. So it's, it's a, a, a really a exciting area uh, to look at there. Yeah, we, <laughs> we've, we've, we've been tracking uh, via that mechanism through uh, in a, a more advanced protocol than Horvath's initially initial work uh, with True Age, looking at about 850,000 DNA methylation sites, looking at the, the the methylation age clock. We've been looking at uh, telomere changes uh, using Life Length out of France, which does a great um, you know telomere testing is a um, a, a challenging place to work. Uh, great data, but uh, average telomere length doesn't tell you as much as you'd really want it to tell you. And so we've been tracking all of these and it's a, it's a we're, we're getting, we're looking forward to publishing our results. So it's been very, very encouraging. Oh yeah. I, I, I can't wait. To, can't wait to hear about that. Um, now your, your, you offer a, a wonderful program um, where you're based there. And I, I, and it, and it deals with uh, patients with cognitive decline. And as I understand, even, even healthy people who want to uh, improve their life and maybe even extend their longevity. And, and maybe you could talk a little about uh, what you're doing down there. Absolutely. So yeah, we have the Maxwell Clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. And, um, and I have a real passion for clinicians. Um, I, I believe that you know, a tremendous amount of healing comes from a great doctor-patient relationship. You know, being known, being heard, uh, and being engaged. And and, um, and so we have a wonderful group of clinicians here in Nashville. Um, you can look us up on maxwellclinic.com. And we do uh, a whole person care. And, and cog neurocognitive decline is part of a whole person care. You know, I think that's one of the things we also, you know, sometimes people get programmed to death, right? Oh, we have a program for this. Oh, we're fix your thyroid. Or, oh, here's your joint pain. Oh, we're do that. You know, it's a person. <laughs> and if you look at them as a system of systems, uh, you have to nail the fundamentals, do the fundamentals really well, and then just continue to be curious in that process. So, um, yeah, we're very proud. We've been actually uh, uh, pioneering in a program called Maxwell Brain, which is a, a large uh, platform that uh, very soon clinicians across the United States can use to help identify what are some of those underlying causes of uh, cognitive decline that are present and, and uh, be able to have a prioritized list of how do we address those problems. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a great joy of mine. Uh, I love the practice of medicine and, and I love, and we're looking for physicians that love practicing medicine too. And and really want to um, uh, want to want to really you know, there are people who are just called to this right that you you couldn't do otherwise right and and to you know have somebody else take care of all the paperwork and help bring you patients that actually want to get better uh, you know that's that's what my endeavor is at the present time in in that domain yeah it's really fun um, I have the greatest team here. I just love my people and, uh, and to see how each of them, now I'm most proud of the fact that so many of our employees get healthy while they work for us. Uh, you know, that's, that's one of my greatest joys is to see somebody just start to trend that direction because of the environment that they're in. So I, I just want to give a big shout out and big, big hug and love to all my, 
uh, my amazing team at Maxwell Clinic. So that's that's great. Do you do you um, uh, do you take patients who are interested in Alzheimer's prevention? Is that part of your program, yeah. or is it you, you absolutely want them or further along? Uh -huh. No, ab absolutely. Um, Alzheimer's prevention, you know, uh, is is for everybody, right? I mean, there's not a patient yeah. who walks in our door that we're not doing Alzheimer's prevention with. Okay. I mean, I mean, you, we, you know, it's kind of funny. You, it, it's funny we think about that, right? It's like, well, yeah, you you laugh when I say that because, right? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's you know, it's a you know, the as a cause of death, it just goes up and up and up. And you, in order to treat it well, you want to prevent it. Uh, you know, so yeah, plasma exchange is a wonderful therapy and we have people flying in from all over the United States to work with us for that. Um, uh, but, but we very much don't want to have to get there. Right. And mm -hmm. that's, and, um, uh, so absolutely. Yeah. So it's almost like all time, it's almost like there shouldn't be programs on Alzheimer's prevention because it's, it, it, it should just be what everybody does automatically, you know, and, uh, it, it, sadly, well, that's not the case. Right. I mean, yes. our goal, our goal should really be, you know, in my mind, it's vibrant health and longevity to 120 and beyond. I mean, if, if we should have that, you know, how do we have more good days? And, and if our, if our goal really is that fullest expression of our genetic and spiritual potential, if that, that's really what we're shooting for, then that's going to transform healthcare. And, and I'm really not here to treat one patient at a time. It's time to change healthcare. We really, and, and we're, then we do that one patient at a time. And, and, and as every patient stands up and says, yeah, that's the care I deserve. That's the care I want. You know, I'm going to be part of the solution by supporting what we see as better health care as philanthropy comes forward and supports research into personalized systems medicine. As, as we really start to wrestle with this, uh, this goal that we're treating sacred humans, you know, every person that walks in the door, they're a soul. And, and, and if we step back and we see them as that, man, does life get easier. And also, you know, the compassion becomes much more easily as well. And uh, right now, physicians are, as a, you know, as a profession, we're near the number one, there's like, we have the highest rate of suicide of any, pre any profession right now. Physicians are hurting tremendously because of kind of getting squashed from all sides, not being able to practice their art in the way they feel ethically um, uh, good with. Uh, and so um, we all get to be the solution together, patients, clinicians, uh, and you know, all of the wonderful technologies that exist. And so we should do so with humility, uh, but we should not, we should also be courageous. You know, when something like this shows its face and says, wow, you know, if this plasma exchange done correctly, done safely, you know, with all the appropriate safeguards, et cetera, you know, um, I didn't feel it was ethical for me not to be providing this, even though it's expensive, it's challenging, um, but it, it, is, it is absolutely transformative. You know, patients obviously would, would, would have to be able to travel to you for the plasma exchange. Is there a way that they can get into your program uh, remotely? Is there any sort of telemedicine service we where do, they we can do start? We do most of it's our- 12 o'clock. Yes, we do most of our care local. I mean, mm -hmm. we really focus on being a center of excellence here in, uh, in the Mid-South. And, uh, but we do have telemedicine patients. For something as challenging as cognitive decline, you really want to have a local resource and, and you will. And um, I, I say that, you know, looking at the Institute for Functional Medicine is a good place to start. There's a group of people, ifm.org, that have a lot of people that are, are, are interested in whole person care and in reverse and cognitive decline. I think that's excellent. I think there are, um, but uh, we're, always, we're always open to starting that process and, and moving people forward. Absolutely. And, and before you mentioned that uh, local referring doctors could access your program as well. So could uh, a patient go to their local doctor and then refer her or him to you yes. for some sort of training or affiliation so that you're 
your work could be delivered uh, locally than through them, something like that. Is that available? Correct. That 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 program is growing right now. Yes, and it's a so we're, you know, um, it's it's a it's an amazing opportunity, but it needs to be done well. It needs to be continue to be studied. We're we're harvesting the data from all of our patients so that we we can continue to improve the care we deliver. And I think that's mm-hmm. a, it's a really important factor of this. That's we don't have everything figured out. Uh, uh-huh. And we, we've done, we've done as many as anybody has. And, and I would still say that uh, humility and a deep focus upon the, the person and uh, their individual need is, is always what's going to be at the center of healthcare, but especially here. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, as, as an expert in this area of, of thinking of the human body as a, as a system and the diseases we've talked about and everything and the, the benefits of various lifestyle approaches and the way we live our lives, I, I, I always ask our, our speakers uh, uh, towards the end, if you feel comfortable talking about your own, uh, any, how you live your own life, what lifestyle choices you've made, uh, that if you would share those with us, uh, uh, it's oftentimes very empowering for people to hear someone like yourself saying what you actually do. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Absolutely. More than happy to. Um, gosh, where do I start? You know, I, I would like to say uh, I've been blessed with a lot of learning opportunities with regard to my own health. <laughs> you know, that's the positive way to look at it. Um, but, but I will say, you know, some of the things that have been the biggest tipping points for me um, is number one, to come to a point of loving yourself. And, and what is it going to take for you to really view yourself as worthy of self-care? Self-care means you're not taking care of somebody else. And for me, one of the most important things for me was to really examine that and to say, hmm, you know, I had to deal with some early childhood stuff to see that, did, you know, some belief systems that I had to, you know, I was only good if I could help somebody, right? I was only good if I was good, right? Uh, I wasn't intrinsically worthy of love and care and of self-care. And, and sometimes we, in this, the, the drive to, you know, change somebody's diet and, you know, I mean, I, I look here at, you know, here's, here's my little packets of supplements I took today, <laughs> you know, which I, I think they have great value in the appropriate way. And, Uh, And I regularly fast, you know, every quarter I do uh, a five day water fast uh, and I intermittent fast uh, frequently throughout the week. Um, I have, uh, I have the benefit of having a great IV suite in my clinic and I utilize that frequently, uh, which has helped me tremendously. Uh, And like NAD but, but, but really, or, I, yeah. I want to keep coming down. I wouldn't, I yeah. didn't do any, I didn't do any of those things until I dealt with the pain within. And, and so we are, we are really fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you're not seeking care, if you're stuck somewhere, then you, you just have to continue to be brave to ask the questions about, well, why am I stuck? And, and, and it's, you know, I really believe people are good and they're smart and they're capable and they want to do good for them. So I, I hate it when people in the medical world say, oh, people won't do lifestyle change. Oh, they won't. They don't want to change. They just want a pill. You, I want to smack them upside the head. I mean, I, I want to just, I literally, you know, want to physically harm those individuals because no, uh, it's amazing everybody wants better for themselves and almost everybody knows that they have a part to do it. And if you're gentle and kind and, and loving in the process of bringing that force to them and you don't go about it from a place of shame and guilt, guess what? Amazing things can happen in their lives. Amazing things. Uh, so it may sound a little cheesy, but it starts with love. Uh, it starts with love of self. Um, if you're going to actually, uh, it takes a lot of self-love for an elder to say, yeah, you know what, instead of paying, instead of my estate paying for me to be in a memory care center, I'm going to take that same amount of money and I'm going to apply it towards reversing my cognitive decline. So I can 
be the asset for my grandchildren that I should be, right? So I can fully be present. And uh, we really, you know, it, it takes a lot of bravery to uh, move forward in life. But uh, if you know it's worth it, if you know you're worth it, then uh, it's possible. Yeah, wow. That, that's, that's refreshing to, to hear that. That's, that's beautiful. D- David, how can, how can people get in touch with you? We're going to put everything down in the show notes. We're also going to link to your, your book, Curiosity Heals the Human, uh, as well. So hopefully people will take a look at that if they want to hear more about you. But could you just tell us your website one more time so that the listeners sure. can have it and it's, best way to follow you on social media as well? Absolutely. Uh, MaxwellClinic.com. That's M-A-X-W-E-L-L Clinic.com. Uh, and you can find me everywhere on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, at David, ha- or, uh, David Hasse, MD. That's D-A-B-I-D-H-A-A-S-E-M-D. And uh, yeah, I'm there. I'm not on social media as much as probably everybody wants me to be, but uh, we're, we're con- I, like I said, I love patients uh, and, and our, our work is to improve their health here. Uh, if you want to learn more about plasma exchange to go to maxwellclinic.com forward slash rpe that's uh uh, regenerative plasma exchange rpe yep.com wow this has been thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you for the opportunity for me to share share some of what we're doing uh you know we uh we're all on this journey together i like to say we're all here just to walk each other home right and each of us play a part in each other's lives uh, and thank you very much for this invitation to be with you. Thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. That is so beautiful. I've, I've really enjoyed this hour and getting a chance to know you better and, and learning about the, 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 the amazing work that you're doing in your life. And, and thanks again for, for being part of this. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you next time!